Shalom, welcome back. Um, picking up again in the book of Revelation, we're up to chapter 14. I do want to mention that uh, I do have another channel. It's on the uh, platform of odyssey.com. There's a link in the description. And if you choose to watch the videos on my Odyssey channel, you can do so without ads. Um, so a couple of people have mentioned that they dislike having the ads. Um, so that's my suggestion to you is to go to Odyssey. And uh, I'd like for you guys to start watching over there anyway because there are some videos that I am going to be posting that will not be put on YouTube, and um, but they will be on Odyssey. So, so you might want to migrate over there. Also, it's a uh, free speech type of platform, so uh, I think it's a good idea to start using stuff like that instead of you know the censored platforms like YouTube. And uh, speaking of uh, censorship-free platforms, you might also check out Gab.com. That's uh, it's kind of like Facebook, but uh, free speech, so you don't ha don't have to worry about having your uh, your speech censored. And uh, unlike uh, Facebook, which is owned by the uh, Jew Mark Zuckerberg, um, Gab, the CEO, is is a Christian, so. So I uh, recommend going over there and checking it out. Like I said in the previous videos, I'm using a couple of books to help me with my study. The first one is The Mystery is History by Adam Drissel. It's more of a Hebraic roots perspective on the book of Revelation. And then Back to the Future by Ralph Bass, which is uh, more of a Christian type of uh, book. But... Like I said before, my views don't necessarily reflect the views of either author, and um, I'm sure that we disagree in a lot of things doctrinally. So I'm putting my own putting my own spin on the information in their books and adding a little bit to it where I can. Okay, so Revelation 14. I saw and behold the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him a number. 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. I heard a sound from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of a great thunder. The sound which I heard was like that of harpists playing on their harps. They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000. Those who had been redeemed out of the earth, these are those who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are those who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed by Yeshua from among men, the first fruits of God, and to the Lamb. In their mouth was found no lie, for they are blameless. Okay, so in the last chapter, we had this, this false lamb uh, with the two horns. That uh, you know, he spoke like a lamb, but um, had the voice of Satan. Now we see the real lamb. We had a false mark uh, for Caesar Nero, the six six six. But then you see the name of the Father written on the foreheads of the believers. Again, this goes back to what I was saying in the previous video that the mark on your head. And in your hand, that's what you think and what you do. It's a representative of who you serve. No man can have two masters. So whoever you take to be your master, whether it's Yeshua or some other person, that's what you have in your thoughts and in your hands. And so, I mean, you really you could also draw that parallel with, with Paul. Like if you're, if you're following Paul, you've got this thing in your head where you think that it's not about your obedience it's just about saying this one time sinner's prayer and believing some biographical information about Yeshua and then suddenly you're saved whereas Yeshua himself says that you have to keep his commandments so it's about what you think and it's about what you do like if you believe that you can be lawless you'll be lawless but if you believe that you need to follow God's commands. You'll have those commandments 
as a, you know, a bound upon your hand, basically. In other words, your hand is controlled by those commands. Um, these are those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Uh, again, this is about following just Yeshua, not some other you know, mysterious 14th Apostle, or the 13th Apostle. Um, redeemed by Yeshua from men, from among men, the first fruits to God and the Lamb. In their mouth was found no lie. So again, there's a, another sign that you know Paul's not going to be above among that 144,000. Um, those that were not defiled with women, of course, pretty much everything in the book of Revelation is symbolic all through the scripture. The... Um, there's a parallel drawn between idolatry and sexual immorality. So if you are bowing yourself down to an idol, that is called, uh, you know, whoring yourself out to an idol. So these, are, of course, are virgins. They have not participated in, it, in idolatry. And then again, that also relates back to the Mark of the Beast, which was only, you know, six verses earlier mentioned. So, the, there's a definite parallel being drawn between the false system, the beast system, and this true system of Yahweh. Um, one other thing to mention is, this is not the physical Mount Zion that the Lamb is standing on. Mount Zion uh, in Jerusalem at this time is basically under the ban. It is um, being judged by Yahweh. There's death and destruction, you know, fire and brimstone. It, it's a it's a a scene of much carnage and destruction. But this Zion, where the Lamb is, this is the heavenly Zion. This is uh, it, it's a heavenly scene. And I believe is is placed at this point to contrast the destructive scene that's on Earth. This is also a very similar scene as to what we see in Psalm two. Why did the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth take a stand and the rulers take counsel to, counsel together against Yahweh and against His Messiah, saying, "Let us break their bonds apart." and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens will laugh. Yahweh will have them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his anger, and terrify them in his wrath. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will tell of the decree Yahweh has said to me, You are my son, today I have become your father. Ask of me, and I will give the nations, or the Gentiles, for your inheritance. The uttermost parts of the earth are for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, you kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Give sincere homage to the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath will soon be kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. So, uh, of course, this is not really the depiction or the side of Yeshua that you hear a lot about, the side that brings judgment. Psalm 2 focuses on this, uh, you know, the anger of the Son and His wrath that will be kindled. And so this chapter in, in Revelation starts off very peaceful, but toward the end you do see the wrath. Also, uh, verse 8 um, what is the inheritance of the Son? Well, Yahweh says, I will give the nations, the, the word there in Hebrew is the goyim, I will give the goyim for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Now, just kind of hold on to that verse in the back, back of your mind for a moment, because toward the end of the video, I do want to expound on that too. So there's a lot of verses here that we're connecting together, and they all kind of build upon one another. Also, many commentators have seen the parallels between the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation. It appears that either 
the author of the book of Hebrews was aware of and had a copy of the book of Revelation, or perhaps God was inspiring both John and the author of the book of Hebrews, which, according to church tradition, Hebrews was written by Barnabas. <clears throat> um, Hebrews twelve eighteen, For you have not come to a mountain that might be touched, and that burned with fire, and to blackness, darkness, and storm, the sound of a shofar, and the voice of words, which those who heard it begged that it not one more word should be spoken to them. For they could not stand that which was commanded, if even an animal touches a mountain, it shall be stoned. And so fearful was the appearance that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling, but you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable multitudes of angels, to the general assembly and the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Yeshua the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood a sprinkling that speaks better than that of Abel. So, in Revelation 14, we see this multitude of believers referred to as the first fruits. Barnabas here refers to them as the assembly of the firstborn. Um, so if there's a first fruits of the harvest, then there has to be a harvest. And so we're going to see that as we get further into this chapter of Revelation. Verse 6, I saw an angel flying in mid heaven, having an eternal good news to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth and to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said with a loud voice, Fear Yahweh and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the springs of waters. So Yeshua has said that the good news of the kingdom would be preached to the whole world for a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Uh, he said that in Matthew 24. So here you, you see this good news being proclaimed to the world. The gospel itself is, fear Yahweh, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. This is the, the good news the angels delivering. So even though Jerusalem was being destroyed, this was good news to the believers. This was the vengeance of Yahweh. It was a righteous vengeance, and it was the destruction of those that hated Yahweh and his commands, and hated his Messiah. And the second angel follows, saying, Babylon the Great has fallen, which has made all the nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her sexual immor immorality. Okay, so, who is Babylon? Um, traditionally, it's been thought of that it represents Rome. You can find many, many commentaries on the book of Revelation, and they talk about Rome being Babylon. But I can tell you, and we'll get into this deeper as we continue on through the book of Revelation, but Babylon is definitely Jerusalem. It is not Rome. So Babylon the Great has fallen, which has made the nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her sexual immorality. I've mentioned several times that it is my understanding that the leadership in Jerusalem was not made up of the descendants of, of, of Israel. It was made up of the descendants of Esau at this point. John Hyrcanus had uh, overthrown Edom at around 135 uh, B.C., forcibly converted all the Edomites to Judaism. And then over the next 150 years, the Edomites gradually rose to power in Jerusalem and supplanted the the true Jews, the descendants of Judah. And obviously there were some intermingling there. You know, it's not that everyone involved was a purebred Edomite or a purebred descendant of Judah. But the point is there was a mixture and Edom rose to the top. So all of these scribes and Pharisees and um Herods, they were Edomites. They were not descendants of Judah. Judah was the, the poor people, the, the common people that rallied around Yeshua. They were the true uh, Israelites. And 
again, this this falls in line with Hebrews. Uh, follow after peace with all men and the sanctification with which no man can see the Lord, looking carefully lest there be any man who falls short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and many be defiled by it, lest there be any sexual immoral, immoral person or profane person like Esau who sold his birthright for one meal. Now, I will submit to you that a lot of the cause of the immorality we have in the world today is coming from Edom. The, you know, there's conservatives who are up in arms and upset about the immorality in our country and really in the world, but the, the homosexuality, the transgenderism, the, um, um, you know, feminism, radical feminism, the uh, undermining of Christianity, all of this is coming from the same group of people. And that's one of the things I really want to get into in uh, future videos. You know, Yeshua said that you'll know them by their fruits. And if you have a group that is planning, or that is calling themselves rather, God's chosen people, and they have nothing but rotten fruit, <laughs> then you know that somebody's lying to you. And that's one of the things I want to start getting into once we finish this study on the book of Revelation. But my point is, notice that the sexual immorality is connected to Esau in the book of Hebrews. Verse 9, another angel, a third, followed them, saying, with a great voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is prepared unmixed for the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name... Here is the patience of the holy ones, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Yeshua. So this, this phrase is mentioned twice in the book of Revelation, that the patience of the saints, the true followers of Yeshua, are those that keep the commandments of Elohim and the faith of Yeshua. There, there is no such thing as a lawless believer. Yeshua is very clear about that himself, where he says, Behold, you know, there's this this person came to him and said, Good rabbi, what what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Yeshua responds and says, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God, but if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And there are three apostles that are referred to as pillars in the early church. One of them is James. And James, he, he agrees with Yeshua. A man may say, and of course this man that he's speaking about is Paul. This is a direct um, refusion of Paul. He says, A man will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder, but do you not know, vain man, that faith without works is dead? The next pillar, John, this is how we know that we love him, or this is how we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. One who says, I know him, and doesn't keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth isn't in him. But whoever keeps his word, God's love has, been, has most certainly been perfected in him. This is how we know that we are in him. He who says he remains in him ought himself also to walk just like he walked, or just like Yeshua walked. So you hear Christians say things like, well, you know, Jesus kept all the commandments, so I don't have to. But according to John, one of the pillars, he says that you ought to walk just like Yeshua walked. In other words, if Yeshua walked sinlessly, you should also walk sinlessly. Second Peter, the last of the three pillars, uh, Second Peter 1.10, Therefore, brothers, be more diligent by good works to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. 
For thus you will be richly supplied with the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. So I want to pause here at First Peter or Second Peter one ten because I learned something this week that I did not know. Like if you turn to your Bible in Second Peter one ten and you read this passage, you'll notice it doesn't say anything about good works. And the reason is is because it has been removed it has not been translated into your Bible. There is only a couple of manuscripts that in in, in 2 Peter 1:10 don't mention good works. But in the vast majority of the ancient manuscripts it says that by good works you make your calling and election sure. But almost every single Bible translation uses the one or two manuscripts that doesn't include good good works. I you know, I thought I knew about all the mistranslations and the little tricks and stuff that's been altered in the Bible. I did not know this. Um but this is something that I mean if it's not a conspiracy, I don't know what is. <laughs> they they uh the translators purposefully do not use any of the manuscripts the vast majority text includes by good works but these words are left out of most bibles so peter himself says that by good works you get entrance into the eternal kingdom of our lord and savior read this several times and and you'll see that that's exactly what he's saying so why has this been left out of the Bible? Well, I mean, it's been left out of the Bible to protect Paul. Because, of course, Paul says that you don't need works. But there's a really good video on this subject. Um, the name of the video is Mistake Exploited to Protect Paul, 500 Years Plus Failing to Restore Good Works to Second Peter 1.10. Uh, the YouTube link is there if you want to pause the video and take a screenshot of it to go directly to the video. But it's uh, it's on the Jesus Words Only channel, and I watched this video and it it blew my mind. <laughs> I watched it twice. It was um, yeah, I I was shocked at it. So it, as you see, Yeshua and all three of his pillar apostles, they all tell you the same thing. They all tell you that you have to keep the commandments for salvation. But people who follow Paul, they um, they refuse to see this. It's almost like they're unable to see these very plain statements that you have to have works for salvation, not just faith. And again, it comes back to what is on your forehead and what is in your hand. You know, are you, are, who have you bound your thoughts and your actions to? Um, Verse 13, I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who are who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their works follow with them. So why are the, the ones that die from this point forward blessed versus people who had died before? Um, I believe the answer is alluded to in several places, but... It, it's because Yeshua has overcome the power of death in the grave. So my understanding is that prior to Yeshua's resurrection, when you died, your body uh, essentially slept or left, or you were in this, this place of, of holding, waiting for the day of judgment. But Yeshua conquered death in the grave, and now those that are believers have access to go directly into eternal life. Hebrews 2.14, Since then the children have shared in flesh and blood, he also himself in the same way partook of the same, that through death he might bring to nothing him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver all them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. But you no longer are held by the bounds of death. You pass directly from this life into the next life. 
Revelation 1.17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He laid his right hand on me, saying, Don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of death and Sheol. And then Revelation 20, The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Sheol gave up the dead which were in them. They were judged, each one according to his works. Death and Sheol were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone was not found written in the book of life, he was cast into the lake of fire. So death and Sheol were destroyed. And then Yeshua says, this is uh, Yeshua speaking to Martha uh, when she was asking him to resurrect Lazarus. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live will still live even if he dies. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, it's obvious that the early believers did believe this because we have a copy of the letter that Clement wrote to James after the death of Peter, and he was announcing to James that Peter had passed away. And in the opening paragraph of this letter, Clement writes, Be it known to you, my Lord, that Simon, who for the sake of the future faith and the most sure foundation of his doctrine, was set apart to be the foundation of the church, and for this end was by Yeshua himself with his truthful mouth named Peter, the first fruits of our Lord, the first of the apostles, to whom first the Father revealed the Son, whom the Christ with good reason blessed, the called and elect and associate at table and in the journeyings of Christ, the excellent and approved disciple, who, as being the fittest of all, was commanded to enlighten the darker part of the world, namely the West, and was enabled to accomplish it. And to what extent do I lengthen my discourse, not wishing to in- indicate what is sad, which yet of necessity, though reluctantly I must tell you, he himself, by reason of his immense love toward men, having come as far as Rome, clearly and publicly testifying in opposition to the wicked one who withstood him, that there is to be a good king over all the world while saving men by his God-inspired doctrine, himself by violence exchanged this present existence for life. So, Peter was declared a first fruits of our Lord by Clement, and in Clement's understanding, he exchanged this present existence for life. So what we're experience right, experiencing right now is not truly life. True life begins when you die and you're instantly transported into the, uh, the afterlife with Yeshua if you are a believer. Verse 14, I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud one sitting like the Son of Man, having in his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Send your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. He who sat on the cloud thrust his sickle into the earth, and the earth was reaped. So, at the beginning of this chapter, we mentioned that there was the first fruits, and if there's a first fruits, then there's a harvest coming. And so now we begin the harvest. This is the harvest of the wheat. Matthew thirteen thirty six. Then Yeshua sent the multitudes away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the darnel weeds of the field. And he answered them, he, he who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed, these are the ch- children of the kingdom, and the darnel weeds are the children of the evil one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. As therefore the darnel weeds are gathered up and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that cause stumbling and those who do iniquity, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, 
the, the harvest is beginning. The reapers are beginning to reap. John five twenty four. Most certainly I tell you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and doesn't come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Again, you, you, you bypass death. Most certainly I tell you, the hour comes and now is when the dead will hear the Son of God's voice and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. He also gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Don't marvel at this, for the hour comes in which all that are in the the tombs will hear his voice and will come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. And now we get to the the grape harvest. So initially we had the wheat harvest and the, the righteous were were reaped and now the wicked are are being reaped also. Another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven. He had he also had a sharp sickle. Another angel came out from the altar, he who has power over the fire, and he called with a great voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Send your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth. For the earth's grapes are fully ripe. The angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vintage of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. The winepress was trodden outside the city and blood came out of the winepress even to the bridles of the horses as far as 1,600 stadia. Okay, so um, the 1,600 stadia is essentially the length of the land of Israel. So the message here is, okay, so you know the wine press is being trodden outside the city. Now, it doesn't say that blood is going to get six foot deep. It says that the blood will come out of the wine press and it'll be up, it'll hit the bridles of the horses. In other words, it's going to be splattering. It's about... Just it's not about the depth. It's not like there's going to be a flood of blood, where where horses are going to be walking through this five foot deep river or lake of blood. It is about the blood splattering. And we we read in, in previous videos the accounts that Josephus gave of the bloodshed throughout the land of the dead bodies everywhere you looked heaped up in, in piles on the side of the road and um, blood flowing you know, just like the Jordan River red with blood the Sea of Galilee bl- red with blood dead bodies floating in it and how extensive all through the land everywhere you looked was dead bodies and blood stained the earth after after um, the Roman army went through so that's the picture being painted is it's not about a lake of blood, but it's about blood splattering everywhere. All right, so the angel uh, stuck his sickle on the earth and gathered the vintage of the earth, or the the grape harvest, and uh, threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. So there's a lot said about the about wine presses and vineyards in the scripture. We'll start off with John the Baptist. But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for his immersion, he said to them, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore produce fruit worthy of repentance. Don't think to yourselves we have Abraham for our father, for I tell you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. I indeed immerse you in water for repentance, but he who comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to carry. He will immerse you in the Holy Spirit. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Yeshua says in Matthew 23, Therefore you testify to yourselves that you are children of those who kill the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you offspring of vipers, how will you escape the judgment of Gehenna? 
Therefore, behold, I send to you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you kill between the sanctuary and the altar. Most certainly, I tell you, all these things will come upon this generation. Now, you know, traditional Christianity with this, you know, futurist view, they tell you that, well, um, you know, we're, we're waiting for the judgment. We're, we're, you know, the, none of this has been fulfilled yet, but Yeshua plainly tells you that all this is going to occur within this generation. And if a generation is 40 years, this is literally being fulfilled 40 years later in the book of Revelation at 70 CE. Isaiah 5, let me sing for my well-beloved a song of my beloved about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up, gathered out its stones, planted it with the choicest vine, built a tower in its midst, and also cut out a wine press therein. He looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. Now inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, please judge between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done to it. Why, when I looked for it to yield grapes, did I get did it yield wild grapes? Now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and I will it will be eaten up. I will break down the wall of it, and it will be trampled down. I will lay it a wasteland. It won't be pruned or hoed, but it will grow briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain on it. Lamentations. Yahweh has set at nothing all my mighty men in the midst of me. He has called a solemn assembly against me to crush my young men. Yahweh has trodden as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. Isaiah 63. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the peoples there was no man with me. Yes, I trod them in my anger, and I trampled them in my wrath, and their lifeblood is sprinkled on my garments, and I have stained my clothing. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I trod down the peoples in my anger, and made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. And now you know the, uh, the, the fulfillment of Genesis 49.10. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. To him will be the obedience of the people, Binding his foal to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice vine, he has washed his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be red with wine, his teeth like white with milk. So what is this wine that has stained his garments? Well, it's, it's the same picture of the Messiah bringing judgment upon the land, but it was not the destruction of the Roman army like the scribes and Pharisees were expecting. It was the destruction of the wicked men of Judah, which most of them were actually Edomites. <clears throat> so now, the literal fulfillment. Josephus' War, uh, Book 5, um, or Volume 5, Book 11, Chapter 1. So now Titus's banks were advanced in a great way, notwithstanding his soldiers had been very much distressed from the wall. He then sent a party of horsemen and ordered that they should lay ambush for those that went out into the valleys to gather food. Some of these were indeed fighting men who were not contented with what they got by rapine, but the greater part of them were poor people who were deterred from deserting by the concern that they were under for their own relations, for they could not hope to escape away together with their wives and ch children without the knowledge of the seditious, nor could they think of leaving these relations to be slain by the robbers on their account. Nay, the severity of the famine made them bold in thus going out, so nothing remained but that, when they were concealed from the robbers, they should be taken by the enemy." And when they were going to be taken, they were forced to defend themselves for fear of being punished. 
As after they had fought, they thought it too late to make any supplications for mercy. So they first were whipped and then tormented with all sorts of tortures before they died and were then crucified before the walls of the city. This miserable procedure made Titus greatly to pity them while they caught every day 500 Jews, nay, some days they caught more. Yet it did not appear to be safe for him to let those that were taken by force to go their way, and to set a guard over so many he saw would make such a great deal then useless to him. So these men of Judah are trying to sneak out of Jerusalem to to find food, and they're being caught by the Romans. And the Romans are crucifying 500 Jews a day. And some days they'll, they, they do more. You know, Hebrews 13.12 makes it a point to mention that Yeshua suffered outside the gate. And so those that refuse to accept Yeshua as their sacrifice, they themselves are now being sacrificed outside the gate. Therefore, Yeshua also that he might sanctify the people through his own blood suffered outside the gate. So when we talk about Yeshua taking our penalty, he was taking the penalty of his believers. Those that believed in him, Messiah was crucified, but the believers fled to Pella. So they escaped the judgment. But those who didn't are now being crucified out the city in mass. The main reason why he did not forbid that cruelty was this, that he hoped the Jews might perhaps yield at that sight out of fear, lest they might themselves afterwards be liable to the same cruel treatment. So the soldiers, out of the wrath and hatred they bore the Jews, nailed those they caught one after one way and another after another to the crosses by way of jest, when the multitude was so great that room was wanting for the crosses and crosses wanting for the bodies." So in other words, there were so many crosses set up with so many people crucified on them. They had multiple people crucified on each cross and they ran out of room for crosses outside the city walls. Just even trying to picture this scene is just so, so horrific. I don't know that we could even fully grasp it. But this is the wine press trodden outside the gate. And then when the Romans got inside the walls, it said that they went in numbers into the lanes of the city with their swords drawn. They slew those whom they overtook without, and set fire to the houses with her the Jews had fled, and burnt every soul in them, and laid waste a great many of the rest. And when they were come to the houses to plunder them, they found them, found in them entire families of dead men, and the upper rooms full of dead corpses. That is, of such as died by the famine, they then stood in horror at this sight and went out without touching anything. But although they had this commiseration for such were destroyed in that manner, yet had they not the same for those that were still alive. But they ran every one through whom they met with and obstructed the very lanes with their dead bodies and made the whole city run down with blood to such a degree indeed that the fire of the many of the houses was quenched with these men's blood. So, in other words, there was so much blood running in the streets that it was putting out houses on fire. It's a horrific scene. I want to end with the parable of the vineyard. I um, We read earlier that the nations were the Messiah's inheritance. And I just want to touch on this real quick. Matthew twenty one thirty three. Here another parable. <clears throat> there was a man who was a master of the household, who planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, leased it out to the farmers, and went on into another country. When the season for the fruit draw near, he sent his servants to the farmers to receive his fruit. The farmers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they treated them the same way. But afterwards, he sent to them his son, saying, They will respect my son. But the farmers, when they saw the son, said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the Lord of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these farmers? So, 
Notice that when they killed the heir, they knew that he was the heir. They knew that they knew who he was. They were not doubting the fact that he was the Son of God. They were not doubting the fact that he was the Messiah. But they killed him to seize his inheritance. And we read earlier that the nations were the Messiah's inheritance. And, and they told him, or they responded, he will miserably destroy those miserable men and will lease out the vineyard to other farmers who will give him the fruit in its season. And Yeshua said to them, Do you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same was made the head of the corner? This was from the Lord. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing its fruit. He who falls on the stone will be broken into pieces. But on whomever it will fall, it will scatter him as dust. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he spoke about them. Now, at this point, I think it's interesting to notice. You know, that he he mentions this new vineyard. Do you happen to know the the first name given to America? It was given this name by Leif Erikson. America was first called Vineland. Vinland. And I, I do believe that obviously the Christians are Israel, um, biblically speaking. And so this this is the nation of Israel. I, and I, I believe that we're the physical descendants of Israel also. Um, so the scribes and the Pharisees, they killed Yeshua to seize his inheritance, which means they wanted to take control of the nations. The, you know, the, the Messiah's inheritance was the nations and or the, the Gentiles. And the the Jews are attempting to seize control of the nations, right? I mean that that's par- that's basically what the parable's saying. Ninety percent of the Biden cabinet or what ethnicity? In fact, if you if you look at even earlier history than that, ninety percent of the Bolsheviks that overthrew Russia and killed the Russian Tsar killed him and his family in a occultic practice, and then they. Um, had relations with the corpses, um, molested the, the corpses of the czar's young daughters and his wife. What ethnicity was 90% of the Bolsheviks? Do a little research online. 90% of, of Biden's cabinet are also this particular ethnicity. 100% of the media corporations in America are owned by who? It, like everywhere you go, it's this one group of people that seems to be working their way into positions of power and doing everything they can to take control of the nations, the inheritance of the Messiah. Just something to think about, something to notice. When you see someone speaking ill or speaking against, uh, like these articles that come out that speak about how much, uh, how white people are a disease and white people need to be eradicated and celebrating the decline of the, the populations of whites, uh, take a moment to look at the author of the article and see if you can determine what ethnicity they are. You'll be surprised how often it ends up being the same ethnicity as the people that Yeshua was talking to right then. All right. Thank you for listening. Um, Pray that this has been a blessing to you. We'll pick up in chapter 15 next time. Shalom.